Revelation 1, 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Over. <laughs> to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the, the book of Revelation, and uh, I did have a couple of people that said when they found out that I was going to be doing this book, are you sure you want to do Revelation? Uh, because for some, when I was a kid, this, this, the thought of this book was frightening to me. You know, you would hear preachers saying, you know, and the God of the thing and the stuff and the end and the blood and you're going to be, you know, and lightning would strike and everything like that. That's why I feel like we should read it. First off, I, I, I do everything on prayer, and, and uh, this one just kept calling to me. But I also think that it's been a lot of confusion over the years, uh, a lot of disillusion over the years. And I also think, you know, that what we mention, we can manage. And there are things that if it seems scary at first, maybe if we delve into it and talk about it, uh, this is something that we can... Uh, actually find some love and joy out of it. So we are going to start this book. But do you have, have you ever, this, this is the salutation part of this letter. This is where it opens up, where he is, he is greeting people. Have you ever had uh, a feeling of, of overwhelming suspense in your life? where you're just waiting for something. You know that something's building up and you're just waiting for that moment that, that to arrive. Uh, when I was younger, um, that happened to me in 1977 when I went to see Elvis Presley in concert. Um, yeah, very impressed. <laughs> this is him in 1977 in his prime. Um, instead of his karate kicks, he would just go, uh, get away from me, you know? Uh, when you went to an Elvis Presley concert, it was an event. I mean, it was a huge, huge event. This guy was known as the king of rock and roll, you know. And you would have a lot of these opening acts. And then the auditorium would just go silent. And then you'd start to hear this, this music build up. The band members would be out there, but there would be an empty part of that stage. And you'd start to hear this song. This, this, this is actual music from a Elvis Presley concert. And it would just start to build up for you. And you would feel the punch every time that it went fast. You know? And people around us are starting to go, oh, he's going to be out here, and all this kind of stuff. And they're, you know, and they're, they're just going nuts. They're waiting for this, this guy to come out. You know? and, and it just would build and build and build. And then, bam he would be right there. Karate kick in the air and singing, you know, uh, Hound Dog and all those kind of things, CC Rider and all that kind of stuff. You know, and there was that moment because it was such a buildup that when it finally happened, everyone was just losing their minds. But what would happen if that buildup just started and, and Elvis never came out? How long could that buildup last? Could you, could you, would it sustain your your suspense, or would you start to get disillusioned a little bit, or maybe even um, angry? I don't know, uh, you know, wondering where he was. Uh, the curiosity, the length of that would, would affect you, I think. 
You know, uh, 10 years later after this, I got to see uh, another concert, Huey Lewis and the News. Uh, I know, some of you are just as impressed as you were when I said Elvis. <laughs> they, I, had, I had killer seats for this one, and they would do this thing, uh, Huey and the Newses, they, they were like a saxophone player would be playing out there, and they would like, they would like disappear, you know? And people would go, oh, where, where's Huey, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know. But I had a seat where I could actually see in the wings where they were. So that you'd, and they actually, they were so energetic, uh, they, they would actually get into this stance to go back on stage, you know, like they were running or something. And they just, you know, they wanted a new drug, and they were just out to get it. And that's, it's a song. Um, <laughs> But I knew, I wasn't worried because I knew I got to see a little bit of behind the scenes of, of what was happening. While other people were in suspense and wondering, I got to take a peek and know when Huey and the news were coming out. That's kind of like where we start with the book of Revelation. Now it is Revelation, not Revelations. We often hear Revelations, it's just Revelation. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of history here. Starts out, it's written by uh, John. Uh, he was known as the seer, uh, the divine, the elder. We believe it was written around 96 CE, common era in Asia Minor, uh, from the island of Patmos. Now, here's Turkey here. There's Asia Minor. We'll, we'll zoom in just a little bit. That little island over there is, is Patmos. And John was exiled there for preaching. Now, I've given some bad sermons before, but I've never been sent to an island. Uh, don't get any ideas, but he was um, in this kind of penal institution. There's some, I just want to give every side of the argument here. There are some um, uh, scholars that actually think that this was a, a vacation spot for pastors, that he was, <laughs> that they were going there. And I, I haven't taken a vacation in two years, so this is not something that they're going to do. He, the, 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 the way things were at the time, it's a very safe guess that this was a penal institution, and that's where he was. And he was writing a letter. Revelation is a letter. He was writing it to seven churches. Uh, he had seven short letters within the, uh, to seven main cities in Asia Minor. And these seven short letters were in the body of a larger letter. The Revelation is a letter. Now, it was meant uh, to, to be sent he addresses those seven churches, but it was meant to be shared uh, by all churches. Just like when people would uh, receive letters from uh, Paul back in the day, or Peter, uh, they would uh, copy them and they would pass them on and they would send them to other uh, churches and all the churches would end up reading these, these messages here. Now the word uh, revelation, it used to be known as the apocalypse, but we've associated the word apocalypse with apocalyptic events. You know, we've seen too many movies and stuff where it's all scary stuff and everything like that. So we, we go back to the word revelation, but it actually comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which is the unveiling of previously hidden truth. Revelation. That's why we go with revelation now. Okay? This book, how many people have, have attempted to read Revelation or read it? Okay. You know that this book is symbol, uh, uses... Uh, uh, sim symbolism, uh, it's uh, prophecy, and it, it, it's a style of language, apocalyptic language, and it was well known to uh, Jewish people at the time. It, they would not have trouble deciphering anything that was written in this. They, they grew up on the, the book of Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, uh, there's, there's a couple of other books uh, that are not in the, the, the Bible that are apocalyptic language. And so the illustrations and stuff that were all about this, they would, they would have no trouble uh, deciphering uh, what that, that meant. Today we might think of it as songs or something like that. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a song of uh, Lionel Richie. Uh, boy, I'm hitting all the, the greats here, <laughs> aren't I? Yeah, just... Uh, but uh, he, there's a song where he says, like, uh, you are the sun, you are the rain, you know? Uh, 
years from now, somebody might look and say, did he really think that his girlfriend was all wet and then dry and all that kind of stuff and everything like that? Uh, we, we get that he's just in love with this person. We can read through the descriptions of that. That's kind of what they could do with this symbolism. Now, the churches, the seven churches that he is addressing in Asia Minor, they were very, uh, they were small churches. They were home churches. Uh, you know, here, here we, we break into just a little bit of, of history of neighbors, too, because we modeled our church after the churches that we're going to be talking about in the early first century. They would meet in homes. If there was a person that uh, was, uh, was wealthy and had a larger home, then that person's house would become the church. We, we don't have a record of actual churches until the age of Constantine. It would be years for them to actually have a place of worship for themselves. Instead, they were hiding in secret, and they would meet in people's homes. It would be a small gathering, kind of like this, really, where people would get together, and they would take the psalms, and they would sing them. They would share camaraderie and friendship together. They would share communion together. Uh, somebody, uh, a spiritual leader of the group, would come up and, and talk about the message of Christ, the gospel. If there was a letter, say, from uh, John or Paul or Peter, they, they would read that letter, and then they would celebrate communion together, which is what we do every Sunday. If there was a new member that wanted to become a Christian, they would, they would baptize them and celebrate that, share a meal together. That's, that's really what the first church was. You know, truthfully, they didn't have a lot to offer. You know, think about it. Here we are in this small church, very much like they were back in the day. And you come here, we're not that rich, neither were they. And in fact, a lot of those churches were really struggling financially. I'm telling you, we copied those churches to a T. <laughs> they didn't know if they were going to make it. Sometimes we don't know either. They did not have big bells and whistles. They did not have big extravagant things. They just had each other. And what they had was sincere. You would come to those churches and you would have a group of people that would welcome you, whoever you were. This was the, one of the most revolutionary places about the early churches. It was the blending of people of various ethnic backgrounds. That's something that many people had never seen before. You come in that door, truly, you're, you're welcomed into this community. They didn't have much else to offer. They would just sing those songs, tell those stories, offer maybe a, a communion, but maybe just a small meal. They couldn't offer much else except the love of Christ. But for some, that doesn't seem like much. It just sounds like a guy talking. Some of them would hear the stories of the second coming of Christ. You see, for them, they believed what we believe. They believed that this child was born of a virgin birth. They believed that this child grew up. They believed that the, the temple was where you once referred to if you wanted to think about the presence of God, and now that changed in the body incarnate of Jesus Christ. That's where you saw God. They heard from people that walked and talked with him. They talked about in these little, small, tiny churches about when he was put on a cross and gave his life. And they heard about that resurrection three days later. They, they would talk about how they once lived in a world of sin where they were slaves to it. And then by the presence of Jesus, that world somehow morphed with the new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And that Christ that they worshipped told them that he would return. And when he returned, that morphine would not, would not be a thing anymore, that that slave to sin, hatred, evil, all that stuff would finally go away, and everybody would be welcomed into the true kingdom of God. We do that too. 
We talk about that here. And like they did, we wait. And sometimes it feels like that suspenseful music is playing. Sometimes it feels like that buildup. We get excited when we think about that. But for some people, it feels like that music's been playing for a long, long time. And they're fighting their urge to ask, where is he? And why has he not made himself known? And why are we struggling? Why are we constantly in threat of closing our doors? And the thing that they had, they had to compete with was the largest, fastest growing religion of that time. It wasn't Christianity. It was Rome. The worship of emperors and Caesar, son of God, the one that called themselves son of God before Jesus, son of God. They built, while this church was meeting in homes, these seven churches were meeting in homes, struggling to make ends meet, just outside their window were temples being built, monuments, cities truly of gold that worshipped the emperors, the Caesars of that time. It was hard to compete with that. Imagine you sitting there and you walk somebody in and you say, well, it's small, we have some tables here, you know, but what we talk about is really good. We talk about it really good and you know what, you'll be welcomed here. You'll, you'll hear some wonderful music, you'll, you'll be welcomed here, you'll have communion, it'll be great. You'd be surprised how many people would say, is that it? Don't you offer any la 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 la? No, we, we, we don't. We, what we do is pretty simple deep, but but it's pretty simple. And that same person, before they came to your church, they walked through an area like this, where they saw huge temples. They, They saw marble structures. They saw monuments. They saw power. They saw a kingdom. Why wait for the kingdom when it's right there? And Many of the people that were joining these churches in that first century were thinking the same thing. And these churches were losing people, left and right, to go worship this. It was just too big for them. It was too shiny. It was, it was, it was neat. It was eye candy for the soul. It was huge, shiny objects. We love those things. Why go small when you can have big? I say the same thing about pizza. (laughs) And this church, this church allowed you to give into your passions, your lust. It was okay. Your greed, it was okay. Your want for power, it was, this was part of the worship here. And you truly could hate people. You truly could villainize people. They were all about saying, you know, the foreigners are the ones that you should hate. The foreigners are the ones that you should despise. Sometimes we want to hear that. You can go out there and you can blame them for everything that's wrong in your life, but then the other option is to go to this tiny church with just a bunch of people, coffee's just old and flat, nasty, (laughs) smells like dirty socks sometimes, carpet has not been vacuumed since the 80s, and you want it. You want to look out that window and see the, the power and all of that stuff and the shiny things. And sometimes you really want to hate people. You want to blame people for everything that's happened wrong in your life. 
But at this small church, you just get some short, fat, bald guy that stands up here and reminds everybody that Jesus said, love your neighbor. Some days you don't want to hear that. Are you drinking bad coffee? Stale bread? When just out that window is a kingdom. The people that remained Christians struggled with that. They didn't know how they could compete with that. They didn't know how they could manage with people continuing to leave them for the big thing out there. And there was also another irritant. As a Christian, it's not a good selling point. You know an elevator pitch? You know, when you have like, you know, they say you take an elevator ride, can you say everything that you need to in that elevator ride? You could say, you know, Jesus loves you. Our church is accepting of everybody. Uh, we are warm. We are true. We are sincere. And people are going to try to kill you. Makes you want to take the stairs. But that's true. Christians of that time, they lived through the era of Emperor Nero, who blamed Christians and hunted them down. They were now in... Uh, Emperor uh, Domitian, and who referred to himself as truly Lord and God. And he wasn't making it easy for Christians either. That's why they had to meet in homes and in secret, because they could be swept away, and next thing you know, your entertainment to a wide group of people as a lion is coming to eat your face off. That's what they had to put up with. It's for Rome, they, they kind of were the people that you got permission to hate. You were the ones that were the problem. And so imagine yourself a Christian in that first century. You are in this small little church. You are trying so hard just to make ends meet. It's a challenge you're losing people because they're going to the fancy stuff. They're going to the, the national movement. And you're sitting there continually preaching that we should love everyone, that Jesus is a message of love, and that someday, someday, Jesus is going to come back and make all this right. You're tired. You're weary. John was too. John was taken away from everything and put on this nasty little island where it was not a resort. He was continually living through hardship when suddenly he hears a voice. And that voice says, write this down. One day, everyone, even those who killed me, will bow to me. One day soon, the kingdoms of this world will bow to me. Write this down. I am the Alpha and the Omega the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. I, I am the Almighty. John starts writing this stuff down. Holy cow. No, we don't worship cows. Okay, okay. God. God knows that the churches have been suffering. God knows that the people in those churches are weary. God knows that the people are tired. And God says, write this down. The stuff that you see here, that ain't nothing. I, I am he, I am she, I am they, I am God. That's where we'll stop today. That's the introduction to this letter of this crazy letter called Revelation, where the churches are suffering. They want the kingdom to arrive. 
God knows it and sends a message to a guy named John. I hope that we will continue and you'll continue to take this little road with me down this book where it's going to be a little bit weird, confusing. We'll see some things. But I hope most of all, we feel the presence of God and know that God is the Almighty. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we too sometimes feel weary, sometimes we feel tired, sometimes we feel impatient, and sometimes we do get tempted by the shiny stuff out there and the permission to give in to temptations and, and lusts and greed, and, and the, sometimes we do even want to hate somebody. Help remind us that you are the Almighty. Help us remind us, help to remind us that you are truly the Alpha and the Omega. Help remind us that everyone, everyone will bow to you. And help us rem remind us most of all that what you teach, the message that you bring, is not one of power and greed, but one of love. Help remind us of that. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen.